Hello there, folks, and welcome back to Raving with Rua here, episode number 26, here on my YouTube channel, Songs from the Rua Room, uh, dedicated to singer-songwriters from Belgium and beyond. And it's lovely to see you all here again. Um, if you are watching on YouTube, please consider hitting that subscribe button down there, and uh, it helps me build the channel and get the songs out to the world. And that will help a lot. Indeed, sharing this video will help a lot as well. My virtual tip jar, as always, is open there too. And all the links are in the description below. If you are um, feeling generous, uh, throw a few shekels there into the pot. Thank you very much. And as always, tonight's live stream brought to you courtesy of the great people of G Sharp Guitars over there in Kansas, the world's finest travel electric guitars, gsharpguitars.com. Check them out. So, yeah, uh, if you're in the comment section, if you have any questions or comments for my guest or myself, please leave them in there. It'd be great to see you um, and let us know where you're, where you're uh, tuned in from. Of course, you know the drill. Um, Tom Yutz is my, my guest tonight. He's in Nashville. Um, he's got a, a string of number one bluegrass hits that he's written or co-written. He has uh, several other bluegrass songs and all kinds of songs to, to his name. He's an amazing singer-songwriter and um, very, very happy to have him on the show and I hope that you're going to enjoy it. I know I will. Here he is. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the show from Nashville, Tennessee, the wonderful Tom Yutz. Hey. There he is. Hello, sir. And you're very welcome. How are you doing? I'm doing great. How are you doing? It's, it's uh, what is it, two o'clock in Nashville, is it? It's two o'clock. Yes. Yes. And you have a whole day's work behind you not done already at this stage. Um, you know, <laughs> I'm I'm taking it a little easier than usual at the moment because everything is obviously on lockdown. So yeah. I just I just use the time to be creative and write some stuff every day and record some stuff every day and read a lot and recharge my batteries. And yeah, because you actually teach songwriting as well, do you? Mm -hmm. I teach at uh, Belmont University in the songwriting program and I teach uh, two afternoons a week. I've been doing that for about four years. It's a, it's a good thing to do. It gets me in touch with a lot of young people, talented young people. And yeah. I, think I, I think I have something to contribute to, to their lives. And so it's a, it's a really interesting program and we're not on the campus of Belmont University. We're actually on Music Row where all the studios are in the building where, awesome. that we're in is the old Columbia Records building. So we have Columbia Studio A and B and B is uh, the oldest studio, commercial studio on Music Row. It's where Patsy Cline recorded Crazy and stuff like that. And upstairs is Columbia A, where Simon and Garfunkel recorded, Leonard Cohen recorded, Bob Dylan recorded Blonde on Blonde in there, oh, and yeah, yeah, yeah. in Nashville Skyline. And so it's a, if the students have a, a sense for that, it's a terrific environment to be in because they can oh, use those be. studios. Oh, they can have access to them. Oh, that's great. How, how lovely. I want to talk to you about your, of course, your, your, your story is amazing as well, um, which, we, which we'll come to. But I just think for the, for, the, for the time that we're in, you know, yesterday, of course, we lost the wonderful John Prine. And I just thought maybe you'd like to share. I know you worked with John and maybe you'd like to share a story or, or two about John while we're, while we're here. Would you mind? Yeah, I mean, I, I, was, I knew him. We weren't like close friends or anything but mm. but we had worked together uh one time and i produced a record for nancy griffith and he came in uh he came to my studio to sing on that and i hung out with his manager in my kitchen after that his manager was a guy called al bonetta who was sort of a uh was also the guy who ran john's label oh boy records and he was a, a kind of a colorful ca character he unfortunately passed away a couple of years ago as well but we hung out in my kitchen here and talked about coffee makers. We had an espresso maker that Brian's manager was really interested in. So that's mostly what we talked about. And then um, I produced a record a couple of years ago that was, that's called Mag Wiseman. I sang the song, the songs. Uh, Mag Wiseman is uh, one of the founding fathers of bluegrass music. And um, I, I got to know him really well. And my friend Peter Cooper and I, we wrote uh, 10 songs with Mac that are sort of the story of his life. And the title song is a song called I Sang the Song, and it's um, written from the perspective of Mac looking back at his life. And because Mac at the time was already 90 years old, we, 
couldn't get him into a recording studio. So we asked some of his famous friends that, that had been influenced by him to come in and sing these songs. And John Prine was one of them. John was good friends with Mac. They had made a record together. Yeah. And uh, so John was very happy to come in and sing that song. And uh, so we, we met a little longer over the uh, recording of that. And he talked about how much he liked that song, which of course was an amazing thing to, to hear from one of the greatest American songwriters of all time. And he was very kind. He was very funny. It was really quick, quick humor. Um, he was not in a hurry. He made you feel like you had his attention. Um, he was very prepared in the studio. There was no messing around. He came in and he, and he knocked it out and he knew what he wanted. And he also wanted to make sure that we got what we wanted from him. So, he was just a magnificent guy. He was everything you you want your heroes to be like. Yeah, he seemed he seemed to be. Um, I'm, I never met him myself. I had um, the good fortune to work with um, a man called Philip Donnelly, guitarist. Yeah. Philip, um, would you probably have met as well? Yeah. At the time, Philip. Yeah. Uh, Philip would have worked with Roger Cook and and, and of course with um, with sure. Nancy mm -hmm. um, and John. Um, so so yeah so they're. They're, they're somewhere tonight having a good jam wherever they wherever they uh, are. but thanks for sharing that i know a lot of people um huge fans of john a lot of songwriters here watching the show and uh, so it's always nice to hear you know little, little anecdotes and stories yeah, and, yeah for you know man as you said mm. um it was so last week when his wife fiona um posted that he was in the hospital i mean you could feel how a lot of people from the songwriting community here just got tense. And then when he passed away two days ago, it was, it reminded me of the day when Johnny Cash died, which is almost 20 years ago, seven, uh, 17 years ago. It felt like there was a, like there was a cloud over Nashville. And when John passed away, it definitely felt like that. It was just incredibly sad because he was just a, such a likable person. And also because his art gave Nashville such a, made Nashville a seemingly a friendlier place because he was very successful, but he moved completely outside of the mainstream and had was, you know, had the first independent label that was really successful. So it's really a, a huge loss for Nashville. And there's, there's nobody who can, who does what he uh, did the way he did it. Yes, it's just well said. Absolutely. You're absolutely right. But again, again, thank you for sharing for sharing that story with us. Um, but you have a brand new album out as well, and uh, congratulations on that. Thank you. Uh, to live in two worlds. I'm, I'm looking at my notes here. <laughs> yes. Yeah. To live to live in two worlds. Um, volume one and two. Volume one came out on March 26, and volume two is going to come out on in September. Um, we so the way that came about was um, I have a publishing deal with a with a company called Asheville Music in Asheville, North Carolina, and um, I signed that about two years ago, and then a little after, a little while after I had signed that deal, the owner of the company, mm. which is a record company, called me and said, "Hey, it's good to have your songs in our catalog, but how about you make a couple of records for us?" So I was like, "Well, sure. I mean, that would be a wonderful thing because I didn't have a, a deal at the time." So they wanted me to come up to Asheville, North Carolina, and make those records there instead of at my own studio, which to me was a welcome. Um, change up from my usual routine of working yeah. here in my own studio. So, um, but I also told them that I had a specific record in mind that I wanted to make. I wanted to make a record with just one vintage style ribbon microphone, like the old bluesmen or jazz musicians would have recorded wow. like a couple of feet away and just one microphone singing and playing at the same time without, without any overdubs or tuning or whatever. And so he was he was into that and he said, well, do that, but also make a bluegrass record with a full band so we can get some airplay. And uh, so I went up there in May last year and made the bluegrass record with an incredible band with Mike Compton on mandolin, who's one of my musical heroes, and my friend Tammy Rogers of the Steel Drivers on fiddle, who I also wrote a lot of the songs with, and my old friend Mark Fain on bass and Justin Moses on banjo. And then I went back there a couple of weeks later and made the solo record. and. Uh, when we were done, we looked at the songs and went like, well, this is, we're really happy with what we got. But if you put the band record out and then the solo record, the solo record's probably going to die a little bit. So we decided to, to look at the songs and the possibility of pairing those songs. And that's what we ended up doing. So it's always a band song followed by a solo song. And ironically, as I was working on the sequencing, it turned out that, that the songs worked really well in pairs, that they corresponded really well together. So 
these songs correspond thematically and musically and all of that. So that's the story of and, it. And this song I'm going to play now um, is also from that. I long to hear them testify. That's from the new. Yep. Mm -hmm. From the new record. Right. Well, let's let's give this a play, and then I'm going to come back, and and I you have some we'll have some more chat about you and your and your life over there. Is that cool? Okay. Here it is, folks. Um, I, I, there might be a little bit of chat before this, but I've uh, skimmed through it, so forgive that. But here it is, um, a beautiful song. And we'll play it. Way downtown Atlanta, where the streetcars run. Early in the evening, before the day is done. If I was in Georgia, boys, I'd tell you where I'd go. I'd hear Blind Willie singing, turn your lamp down. If I was in Mississippi, around Pentonia town. I go from door to door Listening for the sound That hard time killing floor In the minor key Skip James singing the blues Two to open D One foot in a world that's gone One foot here today But what I wouldn't give Hear him sing and play Long ago and far away Yet they're still alive But I want to hear him testify Down to 25 If I was a traveler Of Carolina way Nine years ago, I wouldn't hesitate. I'd hear Charlie and his ramblers playing some old shack. Maybe I would stick around and never make it back. One foot in a world that's gone, and one foot here today. What I wouldn't give. Sing and play long ago and far away, yet they're still alive. But I want to hear them testify. Nineteen twenty-five. train long and southern bound rails ringing in my head don't let your deal go down strange times in the country boys and I'm caught here in between 1925 and 2019 one foot in a Gone one foot here today. What I wouldn't give to hear him sing and play. Right. Don't know what happened there. I think we uh, we were blocked by uh, by Facebook, but that happens. We'll we'll move swiftly on, Tom. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. So well, it was, sometimes it happens that you can't play. It's yeah. it was it was the last verse anyway. So it was the last verse anyway. All right, yeah, that's I'll, fine. Yeah, uh, that's fine. These things happen. Uh, but not only you know are you a, an amazing songwriter, you are a record producer, 
um, of high renown, I should say, and also an amazing guitarist. You're, you're fond of your Martin guitars, I, I notice. Yeah, you have quite a few at this stage. People give them to you and everything. Else, no, 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 nobody gives no, me you... nobody gives me anything, but I have, oh, a, right. I have a good amount of guitars, although you can really never have enough guitars. What you want to do yeah. is you, what you want to do is you want to get enough to where you bring a new one in the house your wife doesn't notice the the difference <laughs> so I love it. so that's how it how that works but that's uh, the, the yeah. one i was the one i was playing there is a is a d18 and it's it's one of the few new guitars that i have i'm not necessarily drawn to new instruments but this one is um from a from the martin custom shop and those were made specifically for Groon guitars in nashville the 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 mahogany on those guitars was cut in Belize between 1890 and 1910. And that's oh, just amazing quality. Stunning. And Groon got access to that. And so they made him a bunch of guitars and I just couldn't resist buying one because all my friends were buying them. And I was like, man, I got to check that uh, out. So. Yeah, and you did, yeah, but they, they make incredible instruments anyway. Yeah. But to get to get wood sourced from that era, how, how lucky. Absolutely. Yeah. But um, your, your story is quite amazing because you're, you're, you're not American. And for years, I thought you were. You were. You're German born. I'm German born. I'm American now. I have an American, American passport. Now, yeah. But um, yeah, I was born in Germany in the Black Forest of Germany, which is the south, the very southwestern tip of the country. So right on the, pretty much right on the Rhine River. I was born about maybe 15 miles from the Rhine River or something like that. And uh, it's a really beautiful area. It's it reminds me a lot of East Tennessee and Western North Carolina. It's really nice rolling hills and good food and a lot of good wine and all that and it's obviously centrally located in europe so it's easy to travel from there but yeah. once i once i got the music bug when i was about 11 years old i i sort of just always felt so drawn to the imagery and the music of america that um i always wanted to go there but it was it was bobby bear i think according uh, you said you heard bobby bear when you're about 11 singing this song and then what two thousand and three was it? You actually got the green card, and you you won the you won the green card lotto. And that was an amazing story. Yeah. Yeah, I saw Bobby Bear as a, as an eleven year old kid on a German country music TV show, and it just it if I'd say it blew me away, that's 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 not a big enough word. It it just showed me something that I had never seen and or heard, and it and it's just like it just. Um, it was like being lifted in the air or something. And I knew that mm. that was, that was what I wanted to do with my life. And the music's music had never spoken to me at that level before. So my, my wife had, and I have been together for a long time since I was, since I, we got together when I was 15 and she was 14. And so she, she had just gotten back from living in the United States for five years with her family. And she, always wanted to move back to the States. You never really felt at home in Germany. And I always wanted to come to Nashville. So it was just a matter of time and waiting for the, for the green card. And we contemplated moving to Canada for a while, but um, it was just clear after we started traveling in the States, we went to Texas a couple of times and considered moving to Austin. But once we came to Nashville, it was clear that it had to be that it had to be here because the music, because of the music business. And it's just unparalleled what goes on here yeah i can imagine it's it's a it's a wonderful place and an inspirational place has it changed a lot over the years since you since you since you started i mean as regards the music industry well we know the music industry has changed but has nashville changed a lot in different ways or has it pretty much the core of it the same or no it's changed a lot and and in my book not necessarily for the better mm. um we're really like an it city as, and have been since about probably maybe around 10 years. So we have tons of tourists coming to Nashville, which is fine. And, and that it's obviously make supports the, the, the tourism industry and the hotels and all of that. But downtown has gotten so built up with hotels and, and uh, traffic has gotten terrible because we just, we have no public transport to speak of. Oh, and it's yeah. just, I mean, it's still a wonderful place and uh, don't get me wrong. I love living here and I, lo I want to encourage people to come, but it's just gotten a lot bigger, a lot more hectic. Traffic has gotten worse. The music industry obviously has changed dramatically. Um, CD sales are pretty much have to have disappeared. So country music has changed a lot. Country radio has changed a lot. 
what you hear on commercial country radio today has very little to do with country music. But I'm also not down on that. I'm not mm. complaining about that because it's I'm really not a part of that scene. You know, it's it's it'd be like me complaining about somebody walking down the street. It's it's got nothing to do with me. So I'm not bitter about any of this. I just observe it. Yeah. Um, but there is still obviously with with somebody like Brian dying, a lot of the old Nashville that fascinated me that that made me want to move here is disappearing a little bit, but there's still characters left like Pat Elger and Jim Rooney and people like that, that, that make me want to live here. And plus there's so many great writers here, people that I like to write with and people that my, my crew of musicians that I use on most of the records that I make, I couldn't, it'd be really weird to move somewhere else and go like, okay, let's find a bass player in Milwaukee somewhere. I'm sure there's great bass players in Milwaukee, yeah. but but once you've worked with the rhythm sections here and players here, there's such an in, such an intimate understanding of playing this kind of music. Um, I haven't experienced that anywhere in the world, and I anywhere else in the world, and I would I don't think it exists anywhere else in the world. I'm, obviously, you can go to Ireland and find fantastic folk musicians there, or in England, or in Australia, mm -hmm. wherever you go. There's great music, but this particular thing that we do here, I think we we do better than anybody else yeah it's very unique uh, to nashville isn't it the, the yes. sound did you did you were you you were you, you your guitar playing sort of well it came early in life but I, and i assume were you were you drawn directly into country music as a as a as a, as a guitarist i mean uh, or or was that how it happened um musically? i was like i said when i was 11 years old i was and discovered country music i was very drawn to it but there was really no way for me to play that in Germany much. But I was also at the same time very much into Eric Clapton and rock and roll and blues and Led yeah. Zeppelin and stuff like that. So I spent my my formative years playing that kind of stuff, you know, playing in rock bands and blues bands. And um, then in my mid mid to late twenties, I got to know a guy from Texas called Richard Dobson, a wonderful songwriter who had lived in Nashville for many years. Who was Part of the crew around Guy Clark and Towns Van Sant and those guys, and and he had moved to Switzerland in a in a weird, um, I don't know, it's just a it's weird under a weird set of circumstances, and yeah. So so we met and we started playing together and making records together, and that that provided me with an outlet to play that music in Europe. Uh, I see. Okay, and then the studio engineering happened after that. Then was it, or was it all kind of connected from the beginning, or? Um, you know, when I was about like everybody else who's into music, when I was getting better at the guitar, I wanted to record and I experimented with recording something on one cassette record and then playing it back and playing to it and recording it on the second one. And obviously those are horribly unsatisfying <laughs> audio experiments. But then pretty soon, pretty soon I bought a four track cassette machine and that was a step up. And then I bought a, a half inch eight track tape machine and that was a step up. And then in my very early 20s, I befriended a guy who in Germany who uh, later on, we also played in bands together. And he had a studio with a nice console and a 16 track. And we sort of partnered up and, and worked on a lot of stuff together. And so I, I have no formal training as an engineer. I just, oh. I just picked it up and then just started messing around with it. I'm also not as, not as certainly not near as versatile as as a real engineer, but I'm really, I'm, I'm really good at, at a couple of particular things that are interesting to me, like the sound of acoustic instruments, upright yeah. bass, acoustic guitars, fiddles, banjos, and stuff like that, and, and vocals. And I mean, I, you would not want to hire me to make a hip hop record. I wouldn't know where to start. <laughs> right, nice. um, can I talk to you? There was a project called the 1861 project. Mm -hmm. Um, which which is uh, phenomenal, really. It's 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 a. It, how would you describe it? Uh, um, it, it it's a fo folky record, but it's it's almost like a, a history book in song. And uh, you wrote all the songs. It's th it's three three albums associated with that project, I believe. Um, if you could tell us a little bit about it. Yeah. Um, so I I co-wrote all the songs. I didn't write them by myself, but yeah, it's three. It's a collection of three records. And it's uh, that all the songs uh, are about the American Civil War and uh, the different people that experienced those fateful uh, four years. The first volume is about just 
everyday poor people in the South, mostly how they experienced the war. The second volume is about the experience of Irish immigrants in, this, in the Civil War. And the third one is about the Battle of Franklin, which was a, a very, uh, it was a very important battle at the tail end of the Civil War. It was the largest frontal attack of the Civil War, and it happened in Franklin, Tennessee, which is about 25 miles south of here. And so the third record is all about the Battle of Franklin. And it's um, there's different artists singing these songs, so it's not I'm singing a couple, but not, but not a yeah. lot. Most most of them are other people. Amazing because you had to, yeah. Go ahead, sorry. Yeah, and there, yeah, there's just some some cool people on there. John Anderson, a great country singer, Bobby Bear, who was my still is one of my biggest heroes, ended up singing a song on one, which was amazing. Almost More stunning, yeah. Yeah, it felt like coming full circle, kind of. I was just going to say that, yeah. When you listen to Bobby Bear as an 11 year old in Germany, moving to Nashville, and suddenly he's in your your studio singing one of your songs. Yeah. Uh, or I mean that again, yeah. Full circle it must have been an amazing. It was amazing. He was the only person I ever asked to sign one of my guitars. And uh, wow. and uh, I'm going to keep it like that, I think. And uh, I think he was freaked out a little bit because he knew this story that that he influenced my life so much. Yeah. And and uh, but then once we got to know each other, he was he was totally cool with it. Oh, and uh, yeah, more O'Connell. Of course, yeah. yeah, Irish finest. Yeah. Irish yeah. Finest. Um, but the song I have here uh, lined up has the wonderful Marty Stewart yeah. singing it. Um, the Soldier's Dream. Uh, yeah, and it, it's an absolutely stunning. Now, there's, there's a long outro, which I'll probably try to fade at the end here, but um, can you give us a little bit of background about this particular song? Yeah, um, I wrote this song with a friend of mine called uh, uh, Peter Cronin, and uh, Peter knew Marty a little bit, and... Um, just approached him about that subject, and and it turned out that Marty's really interested in in the Civil War, and we, we played him that song, and he liked it, and he agreed to sing it. And it's um, it's certainly not a song that glorifies the South. It's just a song about somebody from the South who's yeah. thinking back to to where he comes from and that he wants to be there. But he's 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 uh, He's pretty much dying. Well, you people will hear it. So. Yeah, it's amazing. It's amazing, and, and I, I assume you produced the sound of it as well. It just sounds stunning. Yeah, we did it here uh, at my. We we did it here at my studio, and it's all live. So there's no. What is the name of your studio? TJ Tunes. TJ Tunes, and everything can be found on your website, Tom Um, most everything can be found on my website. Yes, and people can get in touch with me through my website. So if they can find something that they're looking for, I can help them. But I think there's no more physical copies of, of these uh, projects available, uh, but everything is available digitally still. So oh, that's wonderful. Well, I, I highly recommend if you're into the Civil War, or even if you're not, uh, 1861 Project, folks, uh, amazing, uh, three albums full of amazing songs. This is just one of them performed here by Marty Stewart and uh, enjoy it. Dreamed about the hummingbirds in summer The peaches and the melons on the vine The sound of laughter after work is over And the old bell ringing out at supper time I dreamed about my brother and me riding Across the meadow in the morning light I dreamed about the thousands that are dying I dreamed about the south and I was crying Dreamed I heard the voice of my old father Soft and soothing in the August night The gentle loving touch of my dear mother 
They said that it'll all work out all right And how they didn't want me to go fighting And how I went and did it anyway I dreamed that I was laid up slowly dying I dreamed about the South and I was crying I woke up to the roar of distant thunder And I wondered can we win this awful fight Waiting for a sweet sleep to pull me under Longing for the comfort of the night I dreamed, I heard a congregation singing I heard an old hymn carried on the wind I dreamed I was a bird and I was flying I dreamed about the South and I was crying I looked down on the thousands that lay dying I dreamed about the South and I was crying Yes, that's just uh, that's just a stunning piece. Uh, you must be very proud of have, having have written that. Oh, I you know I, this is the this is the first time in probably five or six years that I've heard that. So yeah, it's, I was going to say it might have brought back some memories there. Oh, it's you know it's Marty is such a great mandolin player. He's a great singer, wonderful guitar player, but his mandolin playing is is so bluesy. He's he's from Mississippi, and you can just hear the influence of all those of of uh, the black mandolin players and black guitar players in his playing and, and amazing, I love amazing. that. Yeah, we met we met at the at the the Belfast Nashville Songwriter Festival, and you were you were there with Nancy Griffith as her guitarist at the time, if I'm not mistaken. That was a few years ago, was it? Yeah, um, uh, I, I don't know what year it was. I'm really terrible with uh, like this happened in 1995 and this happened in 2010. Yeah. I, I I don't have that brain, but. I played with Nancy for five years um, on the road. We made a record together that that I co-produced with with uh, her drummer Pat McInerney and wrote a couple songs with her. And it was the fun. Loving, the loving time was it? The loving yeah, kind. The loving, the loving time, kind. Uh, and it was. Yeah, it's uh, the loving kind. The loving it's, kind, indeed. It's about a yeah. It was a great experience playing with Nancy. I'd all I grew up listening to her music, especially other voices, other rooms, and it in. Yeah, that record uh, informed a lot about how I feel about acoustic music. And Jim Rooney, the guy who produced that, became a good friend of mine, and I worked with him a little bit. And so it was great playing with her. And like all those things, it's also great when it's over and you move on and do something new. You know. So. How much, how much uh, Europe had you toured up to this point? I mean, are you over a few times a year or, or once a year or if even that? You mean right now? Yeah, well, before this crisis oh. happened, I mean, up up to the present day, you know, yeah. do, you, do you travel over to Europe a lot? 
Um, uh, we try to, these days I'm traveling with my friends Peter Cooper and Eric Brace as a trio, and we try to go once a year. So typically what we'll do is we'll go to England one year, and then the next year we'll go to Ireland and Holland and Germany and then in Switzerland, and then we'll go to England again. And then the next, so we go about once a year, but I try to go see my parents once a, once a year as well. Once a year, if you can, they're, they're still over there and they're, they're fine and well, that's good. Yep. Well, I have a song lined up from, from the boys, from the three of you. Tell us a little bit about that project, Eric Brace, Peter Cooper and yourself. It, it, the song is Halford's Bend, but is it from a, it's from a record that you made together, I assume? Yes, um, we made several records together at this point, and this is one where we decided to just make a record with the three of us playing acoustic guitar and singing, no other, no other instruments, and and people really like seem to like Beautiful, that yes. stripped down thing, and um, so we're we're just really really good friends. I think as good as like a, I'm sorry that that sounds like a terrible cliche, but we're really like brothers and support each other sure. and and have written a lot together and travel well together we like the same kind of food we like the same kind of music we like to read the same we all read a lot and talk a lot about books when we're on the road and it's it's the most pleasant experience i've ever had in my 50 years of, like <laughs> of of playing music to be on the road with those guys and this song hartford spend is about a guy called john hartford who was a, another really influential musician here in 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 nashville obviously he wrote a song called uh, gentle on my mind which is one of the mm. most beautiful songs ever and also one of the most successful songs and when he was uh he worked in california a lot in the 60s on tv and uh when he had enough of that he came back to nashville and made a couple of really influential um bluegrass records and he lived on the cumberland river here in nashville because he also obtained a pilot's license a steamboat pilot's license because he was obsessed and fascinated with uh, the history of steamboats so he actually worked as a steamboat captain pilot for a while. And um, so he built his house on the Cumberland River so he could look down on the river and see the big boats and barges go by. And he had a CB radio and he would al always talk to the, to the uh, pilots of the ships down on the Cumberland River. And after a while, they, those, those pilots and the captains knew that he was always up there. So every time they came around that bend in the river, they would blow their whistle. And I had read that story at, somewhere and thought that it might be a good idea to write a song about that and you know we just all the three of the three of us are really 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 hugely into Hartford and the humor and the lightness with with which he wrote and performed and and so that's that song was uh also recorded at my place and this the video is also here at my at my house in my, my oh, I was just going to ask where 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 was this uh, shot because it's uh, it's also quite beautiful there um okay let's give it a lash a uh, lovely song called harford's bend folks and uh, written by yourself and eric and peter i assume was it through um actually no it was just me and a guy called um john hadley who was actually really really good friends with john hartford otherwise i, uh, I would have been a little intimidated to write a song about john because i didn't know him well, let's have a listen i, I love this there was on the Cumberland River When they're coming around Hartford Spin And it's the tip of the cap To the man with a hat Every riverboat captain's friend With a spoon still blowing their whistle on the Cumberland River when they're coming around Hartford Spin and it's the tip of 
the cow to the man with the hat every riverboat captain's Yes, and thanks to Music City Roots, that YouTube channel as well. Yeah, so uh, th this was this was obviously not recorded at my house. No, it was no. I was <laughs> gonna say that surely that's not. That's I just, thought it was just my living room. It's right. Video. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's a big house you got. <laughs> it's lovely, lovely. I suppose you played the Grand Ole Opry as well a few times at this stage, have you? Yeah, I have. Yeah, I've played it uh, with Nancy a couple of times. And then I played it with Mac Wiseman, and then I played it with Kim Ritchie a couple of times, and actually played one of my. We played a song that we had co-written um, on the Opry, which was nice. Wonderful. Of course, when I met you know, um, again looking at all those beautiful guitars in that last video, lots of, uh, lots of great weapons of choice. When you when you tour, say in the states, do you go out with a? This is for the guitar geeks now and the gear geeks. Do you, what kind of gear do you do you tour with like at home when you when you can when you have the luxury of say driving to gigs? Do you bring bring a lot of guitars, amps? You know, what's your kind of standard, or is there a standard setup when you tour? Um, so be, uh, when I when I was playing with Nancy and Kim Ritchie and people like that, I, I was playing a lot of electric guitar, which I haven't done. I still play a lot of electric guitar in the studio, but when I tour with Eric and Peter, I only play acoustic. And I I have a a guitar that I bought um, when I was twenty five years old, so it's twenty five years old now. I bought it new at the time. It's a Martin, um, I think it's called DM1. And it's uh, at the time it was pretty much the cheapest guitar that Martin made, but for some reason it turned into an incredibly good and well-balanced sounding guitar. That's the guitar that I played in that video. And that's my travel guitar. And I, I run it through a preamp that's, pre that's called a Tone Dexter, which is a really miraculous uh, device where you can uh, profile the sound of several microphones and then when you plug in your your pickup into that thing, it doesn't sound like that horrible tinny yeah. underbridge uh, under saddle pickup. It actually sounds exact, pretty much exactly like a guitar. And so that's that's a it's a very small setup, but it's very effective. And and uh, so that's what I travel with. I see. Okay. And do you find that you bring out more gear if you're if you're doing sort of local tours and gigs than you would if you're flying, or do you try to keep it all kind of condensed for everywhere? 
I try to keep it really condensed. Maybe a certain shows, if we play a lot of house concerts, I might bring one other guitar. I have a really nice old national uh, duolian that I might bring or something like that. But, you know, I, like I said, I, I have a whole bunch of guitars, but they're, I'm not a collector. I, the guitars that I have all do something different. And so they all have their own voice. They're all tools that do a specific thing. And, and that's, what that's what we tell the wife. Anyway, we, that's, just, that's what we tell the wives. Well, you know what? I mean, <laughs> vintage guitars are a a really good investment and a very stable investment, actually. Yeah. So if you have money to to throw around, there's nothing wrong with buying expensive guitars because vintage stuff, especially vintage Martins and Gibsons, are are there's obviously a finite number of instruments that are available. So um, especially any, anything that was made before 1940 is astronomical, astronomically expensive and Anything up to 45 is still very expensive. Anything after that is a little more affordable. And then anything after that was built after 1969, you want to leave alone. Wasn't there, wasn't there a case where one of the storage units flooded not so long ago, maybe a year or two ago? 10 years ago. Was it 10 years ago, was it? Coming, on, long ago? coming on 10 years, it's, uh, it was the flood May 1st, the flood of 2010, which is also on my sec on the on my second on volume two of my record there's a there's a song called the flood of 2010 anyway yes the the cumberland river in nashville just rose by 40 feet and flooded one of the major um rehearsal and uh, storage facilities where, where musicians touring musicians right. store all their instruments so eric clapton had a locker there he lost a bunch of stuff john fogarty lost a bunch of stuff there vince gill lost a bunch of stuff there and a lot of just regular players um who don't want to store all their gear at home lost yeah. a tremendous amount of guitars. It was a horrible, horrible thing, but I can't write, I had no idea it was that long ago, 2010. Well, wow. and you were lucky you weren't, you, you didn't, you have your stuff stored there, so you didn't have any losses. No, everything was, I didn't have anything stored there. Everything was at my house. And I remember I was on the road with Nancy Griffith at the time. We were stuck in Oakland, California because the Nashville airport had completely shut down. So we couldn't fly in. And I was just watching the Weather Channel and just was just nervous as hell because we live very close to a big lake, about two miles from a huge lake, and I was just scared that it was going to flood. But but we were we were lucky. But when we came back, we went. To a friend of mine, Charlie Steffel, who I write with a lot, he picked me up and we went to the west side of town where the where the destruction was the worst. And just hundreds of people showed up and helped people clean up the mess you know and knock out drywall and and I remember that amazing people down there yeah and it was not organized by anybody it was just people showing up helping amazing and, and then recently of course in march you had a uh, terrible tornadoes yeah uh, hit the place again did huge devastation yes especially in east nashville uh, where a lot of musicians and creative types live and then also it, the path of the tornado went about six miles north of here. So if you go six miles north of where I live, there's a lot of houses completely destroyed. Oh my God, you're lucky. Yeah. Oh my, my, my. And tell me, um, we, we'll, we'll do another song in a second um, and finish off the chat. But, you know, I, when, I, when, I, when I met you first in Belfast, I, I, I saw you as, a, as a, a wonderful backing guitarist. I had no idea who, who you were as a songwriter at the time and uh, glad I found out. But... Um, my question would be: Are you are you more comfortable as as a frontman singing your songs, or as a sort of backing guitarist in the in the background doing your thing? You know what kind of cap fits you uh, better? Do you think? Um, you know, I've spent the better part of my life playing guitar behind other people, and I'm very very comfortable doing that, especially when it's with people like Moore or people like Nancy, where I know that what I do contributes to mm. to the music. Um, it took me a long time to be comfortable as a as a frontman with my own material. Um, but since I started playing with Peter and Eric, they always pushed me to do some more of my stuff. And so now I'm actually at the point where I really, really look forward to playing some shows just by myself. And I had a bunch of stuff lined up, but all of that was canceled because of the, because of the virus, but that's okay. That'll, that'll come back before well, right now. It's more important to stay safe. But yeah. at this point in my life, I mean, it, it, I'm 50 now and it took me that long to be, I'm uh, confident that the, the thing is when you're defined by other people and by yourself too, for a long time as, as a guitar player and probably a technically, if not very good, at least very clean 
guitar player, which I probably am. It's the the uh, m my expectations of myself about my playing are yeah. very high. So when I hear myself play, I hear everything that's wrong with my playing. Yeah, I don't hear what other people hear. So it took me uh, till now to just accept those limitations and and just do the best I can and, and leave it at that. Yeah, I think a lot of singers are, are, are a bit like that too, you know, or songwriters. You, you listen to your own voice back and you kind of go, oh, I should have sung it differently. Or right. I suppose it works the same way for guitarists right. um, in that in that respect. But I want to play I want to play the, the Milltown Blues. I, you know, I said at the beginning of the show that you had, you have a whole number of number one bluegrass uh, songs written, which mm -hmm. is an amazing feat. Is, is Milltown Blues one of those or is that from another... Um, Milltown Blues was a number was a number two. Um, okay. um, I I had a couple of uh, several number one songs in the bluegrass world, but they were my songs, but sung by other people. Uh -huh. And this one here is the first one that that got pretty high up in the charts with with me singing. Um, this is a song about a guy called Charlie Poole, who was a really influential old time music banjo player and singer. And yeah, it's. Uh, and so, who, who was so Charlie Poole was is is who it's based based on? Yes, he's a mm. he was a North Carolina banjo player. He his band was called the North Carolina Ramblers, and he was very popular in his time. He came out of the cotton mills of Carolina and just couldn't bear living there anymore, and just started traveling and and uh, drank himself to death at the tender age of thirty nine. Banjo playing will do that to you sometimes. <laughs> Only joking. Irish humor, lads. Listen, I'm going to play it. Uh, this is Tom Yutz, folks. Wonderful. The wonderful Milltown Blues. This will get you dancing around the kitchen. <laughs> Shoes don't make enough to starve on. Charlie's got the rambling blues in a mill town. In a mill town, in a mill town, way down south. Thirteen hour shifts, and when the week is through, if you even made a dollar, you end up owing two in a mill town. In a mill town, in a mill town, way down Charlie plays the five, sing the Piedmont blues just to stay alive in a mill town. In a mill town, in a mill town, way down south. You're running with the law, you spent the night in jail, sing the jailer's favorite song instead of hosting bail in a mill town. In a mill town, in a mill town, way down south. Shoes don't make enough to starve on Charlie's got the rambling blues in a mill town. In a mill town, in a mill town, way down south. In a mill town, in a mill town, in a mill town, way down
<laughs> I knew that I'd have you dancing around in the mill town. That is stunning. Some mighty fine picking on that as well. Do you remember who the who the bluegrass guys were on that track? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, mm. it's, it's Mike Compton on mandolin, who's I, I'm just absolutely infatuated with his playing. Then it's Tammy Rogers of the Steel Drivers is playing uh, fiddle. Then there's uh, Mark Fain, who's my my uh, one of my best friends on bass, and Justin Moses plays banjo, and I play guitar and sing. It's fantastic! What a track. Where can people get that? Is that on a um, they can, an album somewhere? I suppose. Yeah, that's on my new record, "To Live in Two Worlds," Volume One, and they can get that through my website, or they can stream it. They can buy it from iTunes. They can listen to it on any of the streaming devices. And uh, as opposed to a lot of other artists, I very much encourage people to stream. It's the it's the future, and there's no there's no do way you, to run away. I, I'd be surprised to hear that that you would uh, encourage people to stream. There's his website, folks. Uh, to live in two worlds, Volume One, uh, tomyutz.com. Uh, but just talk to me briefly about yeah you know, what you just said there about streaming. Why yeah. you encourage it? Mm. Well, um, you know nobody's buying CDs anymore. People buy CDs at house concerts as a souvenir because they, you know, they, because they want to be nice and that's yes. cool. Um, some people buy vinyl, but that's not very feasible to, to travel with. And uh, it's just the future, you know, terrestrial radio is not going to stick around forever. It's going to, uh, as unfortunate as that is at some point, that stuff is going to disappear. Look at what we're doing here, you know? Yes. And so, I'm not even. I'm not saying I. Uh, I think it's wonderful because it it changed the it, it makes it impossible for a lot of people to live off of music. But it is what is. You know, there's no there's no sense in crying over. At some point, the the buggy makers uh, went out of business because people wanted to have an automobile, and there was nothing wrong with the with the buggy. It was just that it didn't work anymore. Yeah. And so the consumer decides if the consumer has the choice of. Um, buying a record with two songs that he loves and, and eight that he doesn't like or for, for $15 or to have the history of recorded music on his phone for $10 a month, then it makes perfect sense from a consumer standpoint to do that. Indeed it does, yeah. So, so there's i I'm just a very realistic when it comes to that. And uh, so, you know, yeah, just that's, yeah, that's the way of the world, isn't it? That's the, uh, how, so what, how it's gone. As John Prine said, that's the way the world goes around. And we leave it on that note. <laughs> thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Today. Man, thank it was you. so lovely to talk to you and to, yeah. to uh, hear your great music. Thank we you. We have so many, many great songs. Like we couldn't get through them all, but I'm so happy that you uh, took some time out of your day to, to talk to, to me and to, to the listeners. And uh, keep doing what you do. It's amazing. You do amazing work. One day I'll come and visit you, hopefully. Come on. And, uh, yeah, come over to Nashville and uh, we, we, we'll uh, record something. That'll be lovely. Thank you for having um, me. Yes, come on absolute, over. Absolute pleasure. Uh, we, we'll see each other uh, down the road. Thank you. There you go, folks. What an incredible songwriter and musician and uh, in, and person to boot. Um, wonderful show there today on Raving with Rua. And thanks so much to everybody who tuned in. Yeah, I hope you enjoyed that. Thank you for being here. Thank you all for, for sticking around and uh, please subscribe, hit that subscribe button. Please check out the music of the great Tom Yutz, Tom Yutz .com. Um, If you're into uh, Americana, bluegrass, you know, he's a, a hit maker and, uh, uh, and a wonderful songwriter. We'll see each other down the road on the next Raving with Rua. Mind yourselves. <laughs>